Good afternoon. Those of you who tuned in yesterday will have heard the Chief Minister make a number of announcements, moving us towards the new normal. Some of you will have already been aware of, and others may have been pleasantly surprised by the announcements. Our low levels of transmission risk have meant we can take a bolder approach than was originally anticipated, and as a community, we'll take a very large step closer to normality. More on this shortly. I'm joined today by a familiar face now at these briefings, the Chief Executive of the Department of Health and Social Care, Catherine Magsum. I would like to first take you through today's statistics. The total number of tests undertaken now stands at 5,484. We are awaiting 17 results, meaning the number of tests concluded stands at 5,467. The total number of cases remains at 336, meaning we have no new cases identified and still no active cases. Next week, we hope to reach 28 days without a new case. This is a significant figure as it is double the normal maximum incubation period for COVID-19. At this point, the Isle of Man will be as close to 100% free from the virus as we can be without a vaccine. Today would have been a day for us to come together and watch some exciting road racing and to celebrate the winner of the Senior TT. Usually a day for gatherings, barbecues and live music. It is another big day in the Manx calendar that we have had to sacrifice for the greater good. Another example of adapting to protect our society. But the sacrifices have been worth it. Monday we'll see responsibility shifting to you, the Manx public. From Monday, there will be no legal requirement to social distance. We will be the first place in the British Isles to be able to make such a claim, and one of the very few nations worldwide. Monday may look very different to us all. It is up to you to follow your own individual feelings on what you are comfortable with. For obvious reasons, some restrictions will remain in place at care homes and in medical environments, as this is where we see the most vulnerable in society. Catherine will cover this in, in more detail shortly. For the vulnerable in our society, you will have received a letter from the Department of Health and Social Care explaining that due to the current situation, it is now for you to make the decisions that best suit your situation and what you are comfortable with. The decisions are yours to make. I know that that can make some people feel scared and anxious, but the important thing for me to say is that the risk of transmission on the island now is exceptionally low. And it is important that those people who have been shielding, who are in the vulnerable category can get out can talk to their friends and their family and start involving themselves once again in the society of our island. Over the weekend, social distancing guidelines are still in place and gatherings both indoor and outdoor are limited. The 40 mile per hour maximum speed limit is still in place. This will increase to 60 miles per hour on Monday. The situation we find ourselves in here on our island is very different to the situation many other jurisdictions find themselves in. That is due to all the hard work and forbearance of each and every one of you over the last few months. But it is not a time to be complacent and fully relax our guard. We are still in the middle of a worldwide pandemic. So we must keep doing the basics. If you feel unwell and are displaying symptoms, you should stay at home, self-isolate and call the 111 hotline. Wash your hands regularly with soap and water for at least 20 seconds. Cough and sneeze into a tissue or the crook of your elbow and sanitise any areas that may be used by multiple people. Getting the basics right is what got us in this position and continuing with them will see us carrying on along this path. 
we will each have our own individual experiences over the last few months. We will all feel differently about the new normal, and that's okay. Businesses will also have different feelings about what they are comfortable doing and allowing on their premises, and that's okay too. Everyone will have their own boundaries. Everyone will have their own new normal. There is still a global pandemic and we must still be ready to act fast and take the necessary precautions if our situation changes. Today, the Department of Health and Social Care published the Back to Care document. Back to Care is the Department of Health and Social Care's second roadmap document setting out the next steps for those care services that were suspended, reduced or altered during the government's response to the COVID-19 pandemic. It is a companion document to Back to Health published two weeks ago and outlines pathways to reinstate the diverse services that come under the heading of social care. These include adult social care and our children and families division. Together, they are responsible for a diversity of provision, including older people's services, dementia care, services for adults with learning disability, child protection, looked after children, children with a disability, and youth justice. At this point, I would like to hand over to Catherine Magson for, for your piece, Catherine. Over to you. Thank you, Minister, and good afternoon. Yesterday's announcement about the lifting of social distancing has caught the attention of the UK media. The coverage speaks of a confident nation moving forward as one, of decisive action by a government who acted swiftly to defend the population against a pandemic threat, of a small but dedicated health and care service which pulled out all of the stops to ensure its limited resources were optimised to manage COVID-19. And perhaps most of all, it speaks of a concerted effort by the Manx public, willing to do the right thing to prevent a spike in cases and a surge on health and care services. This has been the most remarkable journey for us all. For me, having started in a role just a couple of months before the crisis took hold, it was not so much a steep learning curve, but an unexpected vertical one. But the COVID response has been a truly joint effort in which government, health and care services, our incredible staff and the public have pulled in the same direction. So a new chapter starts on Monday. For the majority, the freedom to associate freely with friends and family will be a cause for celebration. But we must not forget those who have suffered over the past few months, the vulnerable who've been shielding, for those who've been isolated, lonely, sad or frightened. They will need our help ongoing. Those scars won't be visible, but they are profound. We will be taking into account the potential for increased demand in our planning. For example, a need for mental health support, a delayed therapy, which will make a real difference to someone's individual mobility or well-being. There is so much to do. And while we have faced one of the most challenging periods in our, most, in our professional lives, I'm under no illusions that we face today and ongoing a considerable challenge. On the positive side, people have become more aware ever of their own health and personal safety, and this in itself may change behaviours for the better. COVID has delivered a huge nudge in this regard. In DHSC, our focus remains firmly on protecting our patients and service users. You'll have heard the Minister stress yesterday that social distancing measures will remain in place in health and care settings, and this includes our residential and respite facilities and day services. We have moved mountains to protect the most vulnerable members of our community. Core essential services that support and protect them could not and did not stop during the crisis. We operated in some very different ways in some areas, but direct face-to-face -face contact continued where it was needed. By taking great lengths, we prevented an outbreak of COVID-19 in DHS facilities across the board and contributed substantially to help, helping prevent the private sector manage their homes, COVID-19 in their homes. This was the right decision and has paid dividends. While the virus now appears to be receding in the UK and is all but crushed in the Isle of Man, a re-emergence is not impossible. 
So we will continue to play it safe, retain precautions and include social distancing for the time being in health and care services. This is a transitionary period which we will review on a rolling basis. But looking more widely at the issue of preventing infection spread, COVID or any other virus or bacteria, our focus will continue to be on protecting vulnerable people who use our services. The use of these universal precautions we know as PPE, good hygiene practices and cleaning regimes will continue to be expected as standards in health and care settings. It is part of our new norm. So the other thing I wanted to talk today is a little bit about our looking forward frame of mind and transformation. The project to transform delivery of health and care services was getting well into its stride just before the pandemic struck. We have begun to explore and explain the concept of separating service delivery from policy and strategy. And work is underway on the design of an entirely new health and care organisation in the Isle of Man, Manx Care. Now that we are returning to business as usual, the work to transform services in the future will become more and more visible. We have some real gains to build on from COVID though, and as we've learned to do things differently under pressure and at pace. For example, while it's better, better use of technology to connect with our patients, more efficient practices, or simply making the absolute best of the resources available, we have learned so much of value. We will capture this, and some things won't be the same as they were before. The restored transform services will provide efficiencies and better outcomes where experience has shown that they can. And in this, we have a long-term ambition to place services where they will best serve the public. The emergency command structure that we put in place for the pandemic has brought together senior managers and clinicians, everybody, everybody across health and care to deal with a real present danger. A clear task driven focus at every level has served us well. And we have seen divides and barriers which inevitably appear over time swept away as our teams transformed into models of joint cooperative working. The leadership team is determined to take on board every positive of learning over the past few months. So the resumption of health and care services is now well underway. This is being managed very carefully and it may not be at the speed that everybody expects in every area, but that will improve over, over time. What we have on our side is a dedicated and determined workforce who have proved they are at the best of the best. They have risen to a huge challenge and come out on top. That drive and impetus is tangible when I speak to staff and managers. Health and care workers have been buoyed by a massive show of respect and admiration from them from the public. Facilities and resources are one thing, but a body of staff whose roles are now highly rated in society that at almost any other time in living memory is much more of a valuable thing. We will prize it and thank you. So to conclude, I look forward to the challenges ahead with genuine optimism. I know our staff are keen to catch up, restore services, do things differently as they serve our people and contribute as they have always done to the quality of our life in our community. Thank you, Minister. Thank you very much, Catherine. And we will now turn to questions. And first up today, I've got Paul Moulton of MTTV. Good afternoon, Paul. Good afternoon, Minister. As we were hearing there, the UK media is now taking great interest in us. I mean, up to now, Guernsey's been leading the way, and then suddenly we come in and beat them to it. But, and I'm, congratulations, I believe you're going on Good Morning Britain with Lorraine on Monday, I hear. So, uh, well, that's it's a, certainly, a it's certainly not on Monday, as far as I'm aware, Paul. Oh, okay, uh, well, you know you've got more, about, more than me so, about that, if that's the case. My contacts tell me that I may be wrong, but well, the serious part is here now that both other channels have given um, their sort of plan. They both advertised to the fact that they hope the borders will be open by you know a certain month. There's a lot of people still waiting on their holidays here. We've now got this same scenario, and people are just sitting around, having to have, obviously waiting to know what they can do about their summer holidays. Can you give them any sort of idea, any glimmer that you have an end game with a month at least, that things could at least open up for those holidays? Minister mentioned at the press conference yesterday, Paul, that um, we are building a roadmap.
and the roadmap hopefully will be able to be published next week in relation to how we move forward in relation to border policies. I think the key thing I need to emphasize again is our borders depends not just on the situation for us, it also depends on the situations around us. Uh, my personal view is that the border control that we've had in place has been one of the biggest mechanisms of suppressing this virus for us. It has allowed us to get into the position that we're in a pent up, I'm sure a pent up frustration with people, um, people feeling they want to travel. It is important that we don't release that too early and thereby cause COVID-19 to spike again in the Ireland. So it, I know it's frustrating for some people, but personally, borders, have, from my point of view, borders have to be done in an exceptionally well-managed way. So there will be a roadmap coming out, hopefully before the end of next week, where people will be able to see the various levels on where we'd be able to release the borders. But like I say, the key measure on that is not what's happening here in the Isle of Man. It is what's happening in our near neighbours, the Republic of Ireland and the UK. Okay. So an airbridge to the Channel Islands and other places possible, maybe? Then? Well, I know air bridges is something that's been discussed. I know the Department for Enterprise is looking at them. Um, the only thing I would caution about air bridges is the same thing I've said previously at one of these conferences, which is around the fact that, of course, it also depends on the borders policy of the place you're forming an air bridge to, because it's not a one-way street. If someone can travel into that country, they can then use the air bridge to travel into the mm -hmm. island. Well, they've announced their opening. That's what I'm trying to say. You know, they've given sort of ideas which month they, they're ready for business. Anyway. Well, like I say, we, we'll have the roadmap next week um, I'm not going to preempt mm. the announcements next week but okay. like I say from my personal point of view the borders policy and the borders control has been absolutely critical in suppressing the virus and it will continue to play a very very important part in managing any second outbreak or potential other wave of this virus that might occur in the future okay my next question uh, second question is for Catherine here um, obviously when you got the job you were doing a three day on Ireland and, and that and once the, uh, the lockdown happened can you explain how you what you've done and how you've done it. Have you um, just been in the UK all the time? Have you managed to come to the Isle of Man as a, a key worker? And, and what challenges has that given you if you have had to work completely remote from the Isle of Man in your job as CEO? Oh, yeah, great, great question. Yeah, no. Um, so in the same way as the ministers has talked about, um, you know, I'm not a Manx resident, so um, I don't qualify. Um, and therefore, I've been working here solidly for the whole period of time. Um, um, it's been challenging in different ways, but I, I don't underestimate um, any of the work that anybody does and in different ways in, in the challenges that they face. So, um, yes, I've been stuck in this room now um, since the 17th of March, um, seven days a week, having the joys of um, uh, managing COVID from a distance. But, yeah, in the same way as everybody else has had to adapt, I've adapted. Um, 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 everybody um, has moved forward in a different way in relation to technology. And um, the, the key difference and the uh, thing for me is that um, I'm not able to, to, to reach out to the staff directly, clearly. But um, And that will probably become a little bit more of a pressure over the, uh, of the forthcoming few weeks uh, as lockdown raise, uh, is lifted in the Isle of Man. But for me, I'm still in my study until that roadmap changes. So uh, Yeah, OK, um, people might be surprised you're not a key worker. I mean, I'm sure you would have qualified to come over if you wanted to, or was it just not necessary? Well, the, uh, no, at the end of the day, I'm, I'm, my job is, the, is, is not front-facing. Um, my job is the interface clearly with the, uh, the political um, uh, body and then also um, the leadership directly with the team, so for the senior leadership team. So it's been perfectly practical and possible to do that. The bit that's missing clearly has been me being able to be out in the field and reaching out to people. But as we know, up until this point, um, visitors or um, anybody going into health and care settings has been severely restricted. So like the Minister says, I'm hopeful for the roadmap as well. And I, I just do want to flag that actually I, I'm very, very well aware of what it feels like. I hear a lot, uh, the staff tell me a lot um, through virtually and otherwise about how they would like and recognise uh, the roadmap around travel and the borders and the impact that has on their morale. I hear it, I understand it, I'm probably thinking about it from a different perspective and my own personal perspective, but I know I'm confident that we're feeding into that thinking that the Minister talks about and, and obviously there'll be some further announcements next week. 
And can I just add at the end of that, because it's a very well-timed question, Paul, because it gives me a chance to publicly thank Catherine for all the work that she's been doing. Um, I know she's been absolutely flat out, working exceptionally long, hard hours um, to be able to help get us to where we are now. So, Catherine, can I give you a personal thank you, because I haven't had a chance to do that publicly um, with all these press conferences for all the hard work that you've been doing. And I would also say, Paul, um, I know that when it was first announced, the appointment, and I mentioned about the three, week, uh, three days on Ireland, um, two days off, there were people out there who were sceptical about it. I think what it shows that in 2020, um, technology has moved on, times have moved on, and Catherine has well and truly shown us that remote working works well and it can be a great success. Um, but thank you again, Catherine, for all that you've been doing. Thank you, Minister. And we now move on to Adrian from Alaman Newspapers. Adrian. Hi, David. Good afternoon, Adrian. Hello. Um, Monday, the legal obligation uh, for social distancing ends, but the rules on gatherings remain in place for the time being. Is there a risk that this could cause a little bit of confusion? Why, why were, were these two things um, done at the same time? Well, there's going to be a review of, of the next stage forward on Monday via Council of Ministers, so we will be able to make further announcements on Monday, which I'm not going to preempt. But one of the important things, Adrian, is, of course, we'd announced the one metre rule um, several press conferences ago, and we know that businesses um, were preparing for that, so we didn't feel it was right and fair for businesses to go the extra week um, or two running with the one metre and spending money on that when we knew that we were in a situation where we could go to zero. So it was very, very important um, that we got that message out as soon as possible so that businesses and everyone could prepare for that um, and they weren't spending money unnecessarily around the one metre rule. Um, there would be nothing worse than them being up and operating on one metre for a couple of weeks, only for us to then change it anyway. But there will be, um, we are looking at the next stage forward from this one that will involve gatherings and there'll be further announcements next week. Okay, the second question, uh, one that I've probably got a bit of a personal interest in as a, a, a father-to-be, um, the restrictions on the maternity unit. Um, I'm, I'm still not quite clear what the, what, the, what the scientific evidence is of the risk to the pregnant woman and the unborn baby. Well, this... um, but, but can you give me an idea of, of when possibly the restrictions at the Jane could be lifted? Yeah. Well, we'll talk about the scientific evidence first, um, if I may, Adrian. The scientific evidence um, from around the world shows that pregnant women are in the most vulnerable group for COVID-19. Um, there have been cases of babies contracted COVID-19, very rare, thankfully. Um, but there have been examples around the world. In fact, there was one example, and I can't remember, if I think it might have been South Korea now, or South Korea or Singapore, where there was actually a birth with a baby born positive with COVID-19 um, after the mother having proved positive. So it is an exceptional risk um, category group. And what is important that we manage that risk, as we have said that although we're moving forward and it's likely that the transmission rate is nil or zero, it is important in a medical setting that we still are cautious. Um, I know that causes frustration and all the policies, including the maternity policy, are reviewed on a two weekly basis. Um, but it is important for the moment that that policy remains in place um, for the safety of those within the hospital, for the pregnant mother and for the baby as well. Um, I'll bring Catherine in if there's anything she wants to add to that. Yeah, I, I think it's absolutely, we absolutely do understand uh, the, uh, any potential uncertainty that that, uh, that pathway may bring, but also then people's uh, worry about um, how that will, ha you know, what will happen, what will that experience be. We're very, very minded about this, very, very, very aware of how the um, expectant mum and the family may feel. So um, we are starting to open things up. Um, you'll start to see some changes in the next couple of weeks, particularly as we've relaxed more broader measures. But then, as the Minister refers to, it will be a transition as we transition from where we are now to more universal procedures in the way that we work. Um, so um, my expectation is at the beginning of July, um, it will start to feel different um, in some settings and some settings will follow thereafter. Um, what I would say, though, as well, is we've had a number of, uh, of ladies that have emailed us or families or dads as well, expected dads who are who have all been um, speaking to us. And we've done a lot to support them as individuals and how that experience will work. 
um, talking to them of what will happen when they arrive, um, perhaps bringing them in a little bit earlier as well. So there's, there's, there's loads of things that the team will do to help support families. So please do, if there's individuals concerned, then please do get in touch with us and we're very happy to help. Yeah, we, we do accept, Adrian, that there are unique situations that every for everyone the experience is different. I've spoken myself to several couples who are very nervous about it. Um, the mother-to-be is exceptionally nervous about potentially going through things on her own and wanting the partner there. And where the team can, they will try and assist um, with anything they can do to reassure um, the expectant mother and the father as well. Okay, next up... We'll, we'll say that with... Um... Yeah, sorry, Adrian, yeah. I, I will say with, with the parent craft session cancelled, um, an online thing was, was, was done, which was really, really very helpful and much appreciated. Well, thank, thank you very much for the feedback. I've had other feedback um, in relation to that as well that has been positive, but it's good to actually hear it from someone who's actually been through it. Um, so thank you very much for that, Adrian. Um, now we move on okay. to Rob from 3FM. Good afternoon, Minister. Uh, my first question, just for some clarity, if you don't mind. You mentioned yesterday that with the social distancing changes from Monday, shops will still be able to put social distancing measures in place if they feel it's in the best interests of customers and staff. Where do hairdressers and salons fit into that category, given the extra measures they're having to put in place, given the nature of their work? So in relation to hairdressers, um, obviously social distancing will not be a legal requirement. So if they wish people to and customers to queue in their salons, they will be able to do so um, without social distancing. Um, we would recommend with hairdressers and the lifestyle industry that they continue to use appropriate PPE. They also do need to keep a register um, with regards to the customers going through. So in the event that a case does emerge and they need to do contact tracing, so they do need to continue to maintain that register um, as to who's been going through. But in terms of social distancing and how they lay out their salons, that is a choice for them as of Monday. There will be some businesses, as I said in the main part of my speech, that may be comfortable doing away with everything, and that's fine. There may be some businesses that don't feel comfortable around doing away with social distancing, They've, where they feel it protects, still protects and it still has a purpose for their staff and customers, and that's equally fine as well. It is up to the business. We are handing back control, basically, to the businesses to decide what is right for them. They know their business, they know their environment, they know their customers best, and they're the best people to decide what is right for their business. Thank you very much. Um, my second question, again, just for clarity, we've obviously known that there's been a lot of planning going into the reopening of schools and nurseries with sites starting to open in some form from next week. I know this is largely the education minister's field for a lot of these things, but purely from the medical guidance standpoint that goes into that planning, how will this change in social distancing affect the plans that are already being put into place? Well, obviously, in relation to the social distancing, um, that applies to schools as equally as it does to anything else. There has been medical input, there's been public health input um, into all the decisions that have been taken. Dr Allenson, the Minister for Education, Sport and Culture, appeared before the Public Accounts Committee this morning. He was giving evidence to them and he made clear there will be further announcements next week in relation to schools. Obviously, we do have to return things in a phased manner. I know there's people saying, well, why can't you just go for a big bang and suddenly all the pupils are back? But there are logistics involved within the school, such as, for instance, they're a they've got to bring the staff back in, some of whom have been in the vulnerable category. So there needs to be conversations there around what, what's comfortable, what isn't, um, what they can do as an employer. There's conversations obviously needing to be had with the teachers' unions as well um, about how things will work. So it's important things are done staged, but Dr Allenson will be able, hopefully, to give a further update to the Manx public at large next week. Thank you very much. And then last up, it's Amanda from Jeff the Mongoose. Thank you very much, Minister. I'd just like to build on that last question there, if that's OK. Um, I know it's been announced today that all children could be going back to school before the end of this month. It does seem strange, though, that the social distancing has you know, is no longer legally required for Monday. Why there is such a delay in children going back to school after so many months off? Well, one of the things, Amanda, is obviously the schools have been planning around um, the one metre rule. So the way the schools are laid out, that will need unwinding. Um, there is also, of course, as I mentioned about staffing, 
um, where they are going to have to get if the schools go straight back we've got to ensure there's appropriate staffing in the schools for that these are conversations that can't just happen overnight um, it's got to be done in a measured manner the agreement over the no social distancing was agreed yesterday by councillor ministers and we announced it um, yesterday evening myself and the chief minister so it's been a very short time period now i know and i've spoken to many parents who are exceptionally keen to get the kids back to school and quite rightly so um, they've been off school in some cases for quite a period of time now and we recognize that that has made their education suffer so the earlier we can get back to a school normality the better um, and certainly i for one um, you know want to see that as soon as possible but again it is one of those things that has to be done in a structured way and like i say dr allenson will be able to make further public announcements next week just to go back on one point you made there though you said that it'd been built around the one meter distance presumably that just means you can scrap that plan and it's not so much that you need to plan for that it's just sort of going back to normal no well they can but they've got to unwind what they've done in the way they've set up the schools now, that, you know, in some cases, that will be a quick process. In some cases, particularly the secondary schools, it won't necessarily be a quick process. It may take several days. And Dr. Allenson, like I say, will be able to build on that point next week. OK, thank you. Um, and secondly, uh, currently the island is one of the safest places on the planet to be in regards to COVID-19. And hopefully we'll soon see a return to a normal health service. Um, do you have any plans to turn to health tourism in the coming months in the same way that those on the island travel to the UK for their specialised treatments? Uh, well, the first thing we've got to do is we do have to recognise that um, logistically we have, you know, we are a very small health service in the scheme of things. So there's some services that we can't um, offer. One of the things that might be something we look at longer term, and I know it is something we've looked at in the past, particularly around the new MRIs and CT scanners that are going into Nobles, because the cross cut scanner that's going in is one of its type, I believe, in the north of England. Um, so there is the possibility there that they might transfer patients over to us for that. So there has been things around that. But the first thing I need to emphasize is, of course, we had to pause a lot of services during COVID-19. And that means that our waiting lists have been built up and my focus is on the people on the Isle of Man and making sure that they receive the priority of service before we look at anything like any form of health tourism. The services here on the island are for the people of the Isle of Man and it's important we focus on them and getting our existing waiting lists down before we even consider anything like that. But I'll hand over to Catherine. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree, Minister. I think our priority, you know, the idea is not a bad one. It's just that the timing is not right for us. We, we as ministers referred to, uh, we have a lot to do to get our services back up and running. Switching them off actually is easier than switching them back on. So the example you just used at spread schools earlier, school nurses, for example, have been working in our, in our system in, in health and care and responding to the COVID crisis as part of testing. And we need to extract them, replace them and ensure that's a continuous uh, testing um, uh, approach in order to support ongoing COVID. So that's an example of, of the interdependency and some of the, the time it takes to get schools going. But actually, just going back to the original, original question then, our, our, our approach is definitely on ensuring that we bring back services, we bring back those in a transformed way, uh, we catch up because there is an, an increased waiting list and our agenda is enormous um, just with looking at our own services and for our own max residents and that must be our priority um, so for me that's definitely some some years away i would suggest thank you well thank you very much to our partners in the press as always for joining us today we've had a lovely message from married couple sammy and gareth farrell who run the charity isle of man community meals donations they would like me to pass on their thanks to the public for helping them to fund the charity. The service has now drawn to a close, with today being the last meal donation to the community. They have delivered an impressive 1,550 meals and over 500 other donations during the 11 weeks they have been, run uh, been running into the community. Nobles Hospital staff, Isle of Man prison staff, St Christopher's aftercare, and Sunnydale Residential Home. I would personally like to thank Sammy and Gareth for their great work. And we would like to thank everyone who has reached out to us in their time of need. And, and um, sorry, we'd like to th they would also like to thank everyone who has reached out to them in their time of need. 
and we hope that they've been able to they hope that they've been able to help in the best way possible i would also like to do a personal shout out as well because we are in the midst of care week um, to the learning disability services and all the learning disability residential staff who've been working exceptionally hard and developing new ways of working over the COVID-19 period. Can I thank each and every one of them from me for all that they have been doing? It is very, very much appreciated. As today would have been Senior Race Day, I think it's rather fitting that I leave you with a racing analogy. Our race is not over. Though we may be approaching the final laps and we have opened the throttle a little more, we will still have a few twists and turns with a few tight corners to traverse before we can say we have passed the finishing line. We shouldn't be disheartened if there is an odd bump along the way. We will adjust and find a new line of travel. Yes, there is cause to be proud of what we have all achieved so far but it is not quite our victory lap. I am personally very, achieve, very proud of what everyone has achieved together, and I hope that each and every one of you are as well. Thank you. <laughs>